Welcome everyone to the JoJo Theories Iceberg, a comprehensive guide to the best, worst, funniest, and most bizarre theories and implications of JoJo's Bizarre Adventure. If you're brand new to the series, JoJo is a Japanese manga made popular by its unpredictable writing and exploration of horror, fantasy, comedy, adventure, science fiction, and philosophy. Each part covers a different member of the Joestar family and their allies who fight against an array of supernatural foes with complex abilities, beginning with Jonathan Joestar in the 1880s and ending in the 2010s and 2020s. That's right, while this isn't the five-hour mega-review of the whole series that many have been waiting for, it goes over pretty much every single standout detail from Phantom Blood all the way to the JoJo lands. An extra special thanks to SM Guinea over on IcebergCharts.com for creating this webpage and giving me permission to adapt it to video. There's a ton of memes and easter eggs on there that you're only going to see if you check it out for yourself, so go do that. The link will be in the description. I'm going to use my rotting brain and amateur research skills to try and make a case for every single one of the theories that we touch on, and then rank them based on how probable and just how interesting they are. I think it goes without saying that this iceberg will contain spoilers for the series, but I'm taking more of an objective approach, which hopefully won't ruin your overall experience if this video inspires you to go read or watch. Apart from having some fun looking at this beloved franchise, there's a lot you can learn from its basic writing and themes. Whether you yourself are a writer, an animator, or just looking to broaden your vision on TV and movies as a whole. Now without any further ado, let's get into the JoJo's Bizarre Adventure Iceberg, starting with Layer 1. The first theory is one of the most popular for a reason, and luckily for us, it doesn't take a ton of digging to get an answer. It actually took a lot of digging. <laughs> Jotaro has PTSD. Well, does he? It's never explicitly stated in the manga or by Araki that Jotaro suffers post-traumatic stress from his final battle with Dio in Stardust Crusaders, but many of his mannerisms in later parts may suggest otherwise. In Part 3, Stardust Crusaders, Jotaro Kujo is only 17 years old when he watches his friends and family suffer at the hand of Dio. Not to mention, this looming threat is always present during his journey, and each new opponent proves Dio to be a larger and larger foe than anyone anticipated. The theory is based on a handful of times in Parts 4, 5, and 6 in which Jotaro's rock-solid composure begins to crumble when he faces villains, speeches, and attacks that are reminiscent of the battle in Egypt. The Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration is a U.S. government-funded organization that has brought some basic rules and clarity to the new strides in mental health research that have come out in the past 10 years. Because I'm not a doctor, and because I'm already copying somebody's list for this entire series, we'll be looking at their definition of PTSD to speculate about our dear friend Jotaro. Going in reverse chronological order, at the end of Part 6, Poochie uses knives to attack Jolene in the same way Dio used them in Part 3. This is even pointed out by Jotaro, who lets out a scream and quickly rushes to defend his daughter. While this certainly catches him off guard, Jotaro is still able to keep his composure and put everything into a counterattack. The only case for PTSD I can see here is how he was easily startled by Poochie's quick thinking, which put a wrench in his already limited time stop ability. Another theory that lines up with Samsa's research is that Jotaro avoids using the world because it, again, has a strong connection to his fight with Dio. This doesn't hold much weight in my opinion, since Jotaro devoted his life to fighting evil stand users and investigating any trace of Dio, to the point that his wife left him and his only child resents him. His obsession with fighting evil could be a way to cope with his internal guilt or trauma, but I think it has more to do with his desire to protect his family, even if he has trouble communicating it. But despite my naysaying, there's still one piece of evidence that adds a surprising level of credibility to this theory, and it comes at the end of Part 4, Diamond is Unbreakable, during Jotaro's encounter with Kira. YouTube user Domsy Boy uploaded a video comparing Kira and Dio's villain speeches to Jotaro, who is mentally and physically drained to the point of defeat. Jotaro seemingly recognizes this parallel, but instead of shock, he's hit with a burst of motivation and is able to surmount his moment of weakness, leading to the death of Kira. It also fits in line with his character, building upon his old adventures without shoving him into the spotlight. So does Jotaro have PTSD? Maybe at one point, maybe to some degree, and maybe even to the point where he has to cope by anxiously obsessing over the possible future of his family and the world. Diamond is Unbreakable was also written in the 90s, where the first modern understandings of mental illness began to pop up, with many previous understandings based on anecdotal evidence from the survivors of war and abuse. And for these reasons, Jotaro having PTSD goes in B tier. It's a good, solid, interesting theory to start out with, and it not only fits the world and the character, but has some legitimate grounds for truth. Even if Araki didn't explicitly write Jotaro to have post-traumatic stress, some of the actions or motivations could have been based on people who did struggle with it at one point or another. Since we're already talking about Kira, let's go on to the next theory, Bites the Dust is a Requiem Stand. 
Straight away, I think we can confirm this one to be false since the concept of a requiem stand didn't appear until part 5, but that's no fun and honestly the idea that a stand can develop alternate abilities has been around since the 80s. Yoshikage Kira is the main antagonist of part 4, Diamond is Unbreakable, with the simple goal of living a peaceful and quiet life. The main issue is, he's a serial killer, and to make matters worse, his stand Killer Queen can turn anything into a bomb so long as he touches the object and makes a detonation motion with his hand. I always thought of him as a Patrick Bateman type character, except his motivation comes from his hand fetish, seeking a new victim when the detached hands of the previous one begin to rot. He's extremely intelligent too, making him one of the most dangerous stand users in the entire series. It's also pretty clear he has OCD, not only due to his obsession with blending in and living a quiet life, but because of his extremely short temper and his fixation on the length of his fingernails. He actually makes great use of this condition by meticulously covering his tracks and by learning and improving his stand ability using calculated risks. From my initial watch of the series, my understanding was that a stand can only become a requiem stand if it's pierced by the beetle arrow that Diavolo so desperately cares about in part 5. I thought this was pretty clear, but apparently it's one of the most debated topics in all of JoJo, that being the true difference between Diavolo's arrow and the bunch that he sold off to Enya. But we're not going to get into the stand arrows just yet, not only because it's sure to come up later in this iceberg, but because I don't think it really matters when talking about Kira. There are only two official Requiem stands that we know about, and even the non-canon Requiem stands from the George Joestar novel require the stand itself to be stabbed by the arrow, and Bites the Dust was unlocked when Kira, the user, was pierced by the arrow. I'm sure Araki toyed with the idea of stabbing a stand with the arrow instead of a person, but saved it for part 5 because the outcome would be unpredictable. This may also be Kira's reason for never trying it himself, since the arrow could have killed him or unlocked a more destructive power than anything he could have predicted. On the whole, Bites the Dust is about as close as you can get to a Requiem stand without crossing the threshold, and again, I wouldn't be surprised if this was intentional either by Araki or by the character himself. Kira is extremely intelligent, killing dozens of women without ever being discovered, and compiling more knowledge of stand potential than anyone in the series up to that point. I'm putting this theory at B tier, I think it's interesting, but Killer Queen Requiem would have definitely had an even more powerful ability than Bites the Dust, likely a destructive force large enough to destroy the entire planet. Let me know what you guys think, and now let's move on to an easier topic. Sorbet and Gelato were a couple. Yeah, I think this one's probably true, it's heavily implied, and it's a plot point in Golden Wind. Sorbet and Gelato were two members of Passione who attempted to uncover the boss's identity. The anime confirms that they both wore the same color toenail polish, and the fact that Gelato f***ed himself to avoid watching Sorbet sliced from the toes up only pushes the idea that they had a deep relationship. And when you look at the way that they acted around one another and the way their accomplices constantly teased them, it becomes less of a theory and more of a small detail purposely included by the author. For that reason, I'm putting this in D tier. It's not the most interesting one on the list, and it doesn't really change the story since these characters already had a close personal bond, but it does serve as another layer to the boss's ruthlessness, considering he himself had a love affair with a woman named Donatella. Next up, number 5 gets bullied because he's the fourth pistol. Now this one is interesting. Mista is a stand user from part 5 that has a superstitious nature specifically surrounding the number 4. His stand Sex Pistols consist of six little goblin dudes who fly around and ricochet his revolver shots towards their intended target. I'm sure some of you have heard this bit of trivia, but the number 4 is a sign of bad luck in many Asian countries like China, Japan, South Korea, and Vietnam. This is mainly due to the fact that the number 4 and the word for death are both pronounced similarly, or even exactly the same in many countries across Eastern Asia, and even in the modern age, it's taken very seriously. Similar to American skyscrapers that avoid having a 13th floor, Japanese buildings will do the same with the 4th, just to put it into perspective for you. But wait a minute, you can't just get rid of the 13th floor. The 14th floor would just become the new 13th floor, even if it wasn't numbered that way. And this is exactly the point that this theory is based upon, since each of the six pistols are numbered 1 through 7, skipping the number 4 entirely. Has number 5 actually been number 4 this entire time, and is it the reason he's constantly bullied by the other pistols? To add a layer of my own to this theory, is the number 4 actually a blessing to Mista? At the end of Golden Wind, fate is foreshadowed as a major plot element in part 6 with the introduction of Rolling Stones, a stand that targets ill-fated characters and reveals how they will die. Curiously, it almost mocks Mista's superstitions by portraying the kanji symbol Kyo, meaning bad luck, 
but Mista lacks the insight to see that the number four really doesn't have an effect on whether he lives or he dies. I think his fear of the number four is just a result of his diligence, always obsessing over the small details and seeking to optimize every shot he takes, either in life or in combat. He might not die today, but he does what he can to spare himself and his friends a few broken bones at the very least. When you tie this idea to the main theory, the greater role of number five becomes apparent. The other pistols, mainly number three, bully number five, and while I don't think it's explicitly because he's actually number four, I think it's something that needs to happen in the grand scheme of things. Number five turns his social torment into empathy, and each time he's under extreme pressure, he learns a little bit more about just how capable he is. It's also worth noting just how many times number five saves Mista, and I think this was an intentional thematic tie-in to the number four and the greater themes that Araki explores. This theory gets an A tier. Although the main theory is a little weak on the surface, it pulls in some of the best themes and characters in the series, and it isn't a huge point of tension among the community either. On to the next one. Mikitaka is an alien. Now this is a theory I can get behind. I was reading up on Mikitaka and actually found a list on the JoJo fandom wiki detailing every bit of information we have on this guy, so thank you guys for the help. Mikitaka Hazikura is a self-proclaimed alien found by Josuke and Okiyasu in Part 4, Diamond is Unbreakable. He introduces himself as an alien from the Magellanic Clouds and is supposedly here due to the destruction of his home planet. Most of his odd behavior could be explained as an elaborate act, but there are a few crucial details we learn that make a strong case for his legitimacy. When Mikitaka is on a walk the night before Josuke and Okiyasu find him, he's shot with a stand arrow that weirdly deflects upon cutting through the first few layers of his skin. Mikitaka then falls asleep for 13 hours and wakes up in a crop circle and reveals his shape-shifting ability to our protagonists. The reason the arrow ricocheted is unclear, but it may have to do with the arrow's spiritual will or the fact that Mikitaka is somehow related to the asteroid containing the stand virus. Maybe the arrow didn't deem him worthy for some reason, since he had already realized his ability, or the stand abilities could have even originated from his home planet. I think it's safe to say the arrow didn't grant his shapeshifting ability due to his extreme knowledge of its limitations, and him being an alien checks out considering that this series has Hamon, Vampires, Rock Humans, Pillar Men, Alternate Universes, and Jesus. But still, we can't totally assume he's telling the truth, so we'll need to look at something else. Mikitaka claims his species is allergic to sirens, and he develops hives and mental distress both times he encounters a fire engine. Again, this could be an act, and his red skin could just be his shapeshifting ability, but it seems a little extreme for a normal person. And this detail got me thinking, and I've actually come up with an equally plausible and even more interesting counter theory. Mikitaka isn't an alien, he's either autistic, a genius, a typical teenager, or all of the above. His extreme intelligence and lack of social grace could just be some of his quirks, and despite having a lot of confidence, he could be spending his free time obsessively studying aliens and how to become one. And wouldn't you know it, many children across the world will tell others that they are robots or aliens if they feel different from their peers. This would also explain why the stand arrow didn't act normally, and may have even caused his transformation into a legitimate extraterrestrial, giving him an ability that he naturally understands. The punchline of Mikitaka's first arc is that his mom shows up and tells Josuke that it's all an act, to which Mikitaka assures him that he hypnotized her into being his Earth mom. So now he has hypnotization powers? I'm starting to believe less and less that he's from outer space, let's just rank this and move on before I change my mind. Mikitaka is an alien gets an A tier. There's so much to this discussion, considering it's one of JoJo's greatest mysteries, and whether he's a spaceman or just a goofy kid, he remains a fan favorite for many, including myself. Next, Speedwagon was gay. I mean, maybe. To its benefit, this is more of a meme entry since this theory mostly hinges on the fact that Speedwagon never married and he was Jonathan Joestar's best friend. It's pretty weak, and again, I don't think it recontextualizes or changes much of the lore. I figured the reason Speedwagon was never married was because he was a career man, focused on building his business and serving the Joestar family, something that can come at a heavy cost. I think a better theory is that Speedwagon is a Sigma male, or that he kept his personal life a secret in order to protect his family from any supernatural harm that may have come his way. Overall, this theory gets a D tier. Speedwagon is a fan favorite with a lot to talk about, but this theory doesn't have as much weight as the others. And the last entry on layer one of the Jojo Iceberg is Jonathan had a horse. This comes from the fact that Dio Brando survives his defeat in Phantom Blood by stealing the body of Jonathan Joestar and goes on to father many children in the pursuit of his heaven plan. 
I'm not sure about any physical evidence, but Dio clearly doesn't need more than his vampire abilities to convince people to do basically anything. This does raise a few questions about the DNA of his children, but we'll cover that in depth later on. Now we descend to layer two. Welcome to layer two, where I have coincidentally covered two of these topics in previous videos. Things are already picking up, both in the amount of topics on this layer and the subject matter itself, so let's get into it. Theory number one, Dapio is the original personality. Diabolo is the boss of Passione, the organized crime ring that Giorno Giovanna infiltrates in Part 5, Golden Wind. And this theory challenges what most assume about his dissociative identity disorder. Since Diabolo was a child, he was obsessed with erasing any trace of his history or his identity. In 1986, he came across six stand arrows in Egypt, selling five to any the hag and keeping the unique beetle arrow for himself, which he would use to grant stands to the various members of his organization. In both the manga and the anime, the reader is led to believe that this intense fear of being discovered led to prolonged paranoia, and thus Diavolo developed DID, and Dapio became another soul inhabiting his body. You might initially see this as a complication, since a young, unpredictable man could throw a wrench in Diavolo's efforts to stay in the shadows, but Dapio actually serves as a loyal right hand to the boss, though he remains unaware that they share the same physical body. This theory states that Dapio may have been the original personality, and Diavolo was developed somewhere along the line, presumably when Dapio reached the age of around 20 or so. This is an interesting theory at first, but comes to a dead end pretty quickly. This would imply that Dapio found the arrows and started Passione, despite his clear lack of knowledge when following the boss's orders. It also means that Dapio is Trish's true father, despite Diavolo and Trish having a similar spiritual bond to the Joe Stars. And while DID and certain abilities can alter the aging process of a regular person in JoJo's universe, it makes less sense that Diavolo stopped Dapio's age at 20 and basically picked up where he left off. My point is, you really have to stretch and bend the facts to see this one, unless it isn't DID, at least not in the traditional sense. Could Diavolo, named after the Italian word for devil, actually be an evil spirit possessing the body of Dapio? This means that much of his backstory is either fabricated or completely unknown, which honestly wouldn't be surprising. It seems to work, considering Diavolo basically whispers in Dapio's ear and gets him to do anything, reminiscent of classic depictions of demon possession, but it's not very likely. Much of this story hinges on Diavolo's long-term goals, so what would motivate a demon to start a crime organization in the first place? This theory gets a D tier. It's an interesting thought to think about, but it's just kind of like a little what-if scenario. Continuing on, Shizuka's mom was killed by Kira. I and many others find this theory equally plausible as it is wholesome. Shizuka is a baby stand user from part four, Diamond is Unbreakable, who is abandoned on the side of the road and later adopted by Joseph Joestar. She has the ability to turn herself and her surroundings invisible, but can't use it in any positive, meaningful way, often disappearing and getting into dangerous situations. Joseph uses his perceptive skills to deduce that the baby's stand is related to her stress, and likely appeared in a way similar to sudden onset allergies or mental illnesses. While her mother may have abandoned the child on purpose, Chapter 50 closes by mentioning an evil lurking in Morio, just after Joseph and Josuke's initial shock of finding the invisible baby. Pairing this with the naive optimism of Koichi at the beginning of the same chapter, I'm totally confident that Shizuka's mom was killed by Kira off-screen. It's this kind of context, the setup and punchline, the irony or the reality behind a story that writers use to subliminally change the expectations and meanings of plot details and events. Another explanation is that Shizuka's ability activated first, separating the poor child from her mother, but I feel like the mother's absence in the rest of the story is definitely a sign that she's not returning. This gets a B tier only because it's something that a lot of people already assumed to be the case, but it's still fun to pick apart every detail worked into the text. And while we're on the subject of old Joseph Joestar, the next theory is that he was faking his senility the entire time he was in Moria. Joseph faked his senility. I totally believe this one, and it's for the exact reasons that you might expect. Joseph Joestar is a master of wit, and while this was toned down in part three, his fighting style revolves around analyzing, predicting, and trapping his enemies. For those new to the series, Joseph Joestar is the protagonist of Part 2, Battle Tendency, and is a fan favorite due to his ability to triumph over his foes, despite how hot-headed and naive he can be. He went on to join the Stardust Crusaders in Part 3 as a much older man, and by Part 4, he's 78 and can't get around very well. 
This theory states that while he may be geriatric, he's just as sharp as he used to be, if not more so. Surprisingly, there are a number of factors to consider, and even thematically, going senile would be ironic for someone with borderline clairvoyance. But man, I want to believe so hard that Joseph is faking it, waiting until the last possible moment to drop the act and jump into action. Araki didn't speak much on Part 4 Joseph, but he did clarify in an interview that Joseph is alive in Part 6. I think he might be a bit senile, but I believe he is alive. At 90 years old, Joseph is only a bit senile, but this still doesn't give a clear answer about his mental state in 1999. In all honesty, I think it's a little bit of both. I mean, I always got Yoda vibes from him, like, yeah, he's a little crazy and a little senile, but don't underestimate this guy, because he's always got a trick up his sleeve. Joseph faked his senility gets a B tier, since Joseph is a fan favorite and exploring his character past part 3 is always a fun rabbit hole to get stuck in. The theory itself has no direct evidence and is mostly based on information from previous parts, so it suffers from a lack of depth. But keeping Joseph out of the spotlight was definitely a good decision, and his inclusion is just such a twisted situation for the protagonist to be in. If it was revealed that Joseph was faking his mental decline, he probably would have had no excuse for being an absent father to Josuke, and it would have been much harder to feel sympathy for him. Keeping it ambiguous helps Joseph stay flexible as a character, broadening the things that Araki could do with him. This is one of those cases where leaving it up to the audience is used in a really unique and smart way, rather than as a lazy cop-out. We talked about Part 4 a lot so far, so let's jump to Part 6. Stone Free has a self-preservation instinct. This theory starts with the idea that Jolene may have inherited Star Platinum's self-defense mechanism, the one we see guarding Jotaro in the hospital in Part 6. We never see any instances of Stone Free acting in a similar fashion, and in truth, I think this is an ability unique to Jotaro due to his wisdom and experience using Star Platinum. But this theory goes one step further, suggesting that Jolene is always protected from minor attacks due to the armor and shape-shifting abilities provided by her stand. Not only can Jolene unravel 70% of her body to avoid, repair, and lighten any attacks coming her way, but she can weave bulletproof silk armor out of that same string and wear it whenever, wherever, assuming it doesn't take a lot of energy. Who knows what else this stand can do, considering the entire point is versatility and not brute force. She can basically counter anyone she comes across with a variety of nets and ropes, and she has full access to Spider-Man abilities save for Spidey Sense, which she still has in some capacity. Stone Free can also be used in a short-range humanoid form that seems to be a lighter build of Star Platinum with less precision. This theory gets a B tier because it's a huge rabbit hole that you can get into with your friends, like, what would you do if you had Stone Free? I'd probably use it to like make custom shirts and hats and stuff, but I guess I'd have to be naked if I wanted to use it to fight, so whatever. Jotaro is neurodivergent. We've already talked about Jotaro having PTSD, but this theory takes it in a different direction, stating that Jotaro is neurodivergent in other ways. The iceberg seems to jokingly cite his fascination with marine biology as a fixation, but this term, originating in Freudian psychology, was later used to describe a person's obsession with something persisting from childhood to adulthood, often due to a lack of social or mental development. I wouldn't say Jotaro is fixated on marine biology in any meaningful way, rather that it's a hobby or an interest he became passionate about over time. Considering the fact that he grew up in Japan and had many adventures in and around the sea, and further, the fact that he shows an interest in the way organisms and stands work, it isn't too surprising that he chose to study marine life and pursue it as a career. The anime adds a scene in Stardust Crusaders indicating that Jotaro showed interest at a younger age, and unless this is all a front for Jotaro's work with the Speedwagon Foundation, I'd say his interests have nothing to do with a potential medical condition. For that reason, this theory gets a D tier. Another fun idea to mess around with, but more of a meme than a legitimate case. Foo Fighters as Neurodivergent also gets a D tier for the same reason. Foo Fighters is a stand that allows a colony of Plankton to inhabit and control the body of Atro, a dead prisoner from Part 6, Stone Ocean. Not only do these Plankton operate as a hive mind, but they're literally Plankton, so we can't really apply the same human psychology that we can with Jotaro. I always saw Foo Fighters as sort of the cliché Pinocchio or like 21st century man type character, just a little less concerned with perfecting what it is to be human. The iceberg once again points out the character's fixation, this time on water, but by that logic, Jolene is neurodivergent for wanting her father's disc, and Poochie is neurodivergent for facilitating the heaven plan. 
I probably just wasted a few minutes taking a meme a little too seriously, so let's move on to a classic theory among the JoJo community, that Star Platinum is Jonathan Joestar's spirit. Once again, this theory is widely accepted as false, but still carries a lot of weight and interesting implications. Araki got in some hot water for killing off Jonathan at the end of part 1, so he kind of rebooted the character in the form of Joseph Joestar for part 2, Battle Tendency. And if you look at the manga, Joseph looks nearly identical to Jonathan, allowing a fresh new take on the character, beginning a trend that would carry on to this very day. The same goes for Stardust Crusaders, where Jotaro closely resembles his predecessors in both the manga and the OVA, but takes on a more distinctive look in the anime. This has led some to speculate on Star Platinum's design as well, since it too follows a similar build and color palette to Jonathan and Joseph Joestar. It's a cool theory to think that Jotaro is always walking beside his great-great-grandfather, the most honorable Joestar who started it all, but it would be way more obvious if that's what was intended. Some have also pointed to Bruford from Part 1 as another candidate, who bears an even more striking resemblance to Star Platinum, but it wouldn't make a ton of sense for this random side character from Part 1 to stick around for three more parts. I think we can chalk it up to Araki's style, citing his previous manga like Cool Shock and Bo as proof, since many of these characters follow similar designs. But there's just something comforting about Jonathan being with the rest of the Joestars through the original universe. I mean, Technically, he already was, just without a head. C tier, super wholesome, but this definitely isn't true. <laughs> Mikitaka is cars. That's right, Mikitaka is back for another entry on this list. While it might not be immediately apparent, cars and Mikitaka share a striking number of similarities, leading some to believe them to be one and the same. Cars is the leader of the Pillarmen, a race of ancient superhumans who sleep for millennia at a time. Not only are they the creators of the Stone Mask from Part 1, but they seek to expand their power with the Red Stone of Asia, thus setting up the main conflict for Part 2. Kars eventually succeeds and gains a new shape-shifting ability similar in concept to Mikitaka's ability. Even before becoming the ultimate life form, Kars was able to manipulate his body and create complex light blades, and not only are these characters both uniquely devoid of a stand ability, but Kars is last seen floating in space. As we know from earlier, Mikitaka randomly appears out of the sky one day and is one of the only people in Morio who has an ability that is not a stand. Is it far-fetched to believe that Kars may have just lost his memory and somehow evolved his powers while floating in space? Not necessarily, but this theory is stretching and bending quite a few rules. It's nice to get a conclusion for Kars, but because there's nothing directly proving these two characters to be one and the same, I can't say that this theory holds much water. Mikitaka may have a more versatile stand, but he can't make complex forms and organic life in the way that Kars can. And while his skin may be able to deflect an arrow, Kars has a much, much more powerful form. This also implies that the Pillarmen may be aliens or somehow related to the stand asteroid, but we'll talk about both of those later on. For now, let's talk about the two theories I've already covered on my channel before. Alessi is a pedophile, and Daniel J. Darby knew that Jotaro could beat Dio. Alessi's episodes are by far the most disturbing in Part 3, and potentially in all of JoJo, due to the nature and imagery of the horror that unfolds. Jean-Pierre Polnareff needs to escape Sethin, Alessi's stand that rapidly de-ages victims until they're easier to beat up or kill. But some of the language and images used in not only the original manga, but most future depictions of Alessi, indicate that he uses his ability for more nefarious deeds. There are debates over his outspoken desire to pick on children and what that may truly mean, but that still doesn't explain his tone of voice in the anime and just the general vibe that he gives off. A previous commenter also pointed out that the term Shotaro complex, meaning, in essence, an attraction to young boys, spawned from Shotaro Kaneda, the protagonist of the Tetsujin 28 series. The original Tetsujin theme song was also a heavy inspiration for Sethin's design, so is this really a coincidence? I still believe that Alessi was meant to be written as a child predator, but I'm not going to deny any strong evidence that proves otherwise. So leave your comments below and check out my video all about this guy. Alessi is a pedophile gets a B tier. It's really interesting diving into the translation history and examining every bit of writing that either fairly or unfairly portrays this character, all to find the answer to a point of debate that has existed since before the Stardust Crusaders anime. Now on to another crowd favorite, the idea that Daniel J. Darby didn't break under the pressure of losing his poker match with Jotaro, but rather the realization that Jotaro and Dio had the same stand. While this theory is largely unsupported, it's interesting to see the implications it had on the characters' backstories and abilities. 
Darby is one of Dio's nine glory god stand users with the ability to take the soul of someone weak or someone in a weakened state. At the end of an amazingly written poker match with Jotaro, Darby loses his cool and begins suspecting foul play, only to realize Star Platinum has gotten a drink and a cigarette completely under his nose. The ultimate nail in the coffin is when Jotaro not only bets his mother's soul, but asks Darby to reveal the secret of Dio's stand, sending him into a mental breakdown and releasing all of his previous victims. While it's never stated that Darby knew of the world's secret ability, it's heavily implied and it makes sense that the most level-headed among Dio's ranks would know. And seeing him accept defeat instead of calling or revealing any knowledge just shows you how loyal he was. Considering this information, it is believed by some that upon Jotaro's request, Darby put the pieces together and realized that Star Platinum's speed and precision rival that of the world's, thus predicting Jotaro's ability many, many chapters early. While this is an interesting implication to focus on, I think it's part of Darby's greater realization that the Crusaders are not to be underestimated in any capacity. Darby knew Jotaro had the world gets C tier. It doesn't affect the plot in any major way, but it's a reasonable thing to assume considering Darby's loyalty and attention to detail. Sticking with the same character, next up we have the Darby brothers were lying about the souls perishing upon their death. One of the first questions when it comes to the Darby brothers is, can't you just kill them instead of playing the game? The answer of course is yes, but both Terence and Daniel maintain a collection of souls that would be lost in the event of their death. This forces the characters to play along, but theoretically both brothers could have just been lying. This is a valid theory, but it's just kind of stupid. That's like saying this entire video doesn't matter because JoJo is just a manga series that has no effect on our daily lives. Trapping your characters in a box is a great way to come up with creative story beats, so it's necessary to have little rules and explanations in place. Araki is famous for the amount of effort he puts into his illustrations, where every stroke of the pen changes the overall meaning of the piece, and I'm sure he applies the same philosophy to his writing. This gets a D tier, funny for like two seconds. Next up we have Dyer is Jesus. Yeah, I couldn't figure out what this refers to other than information about the Japanese miracle, a period of economic growth following World War II. This is also a good opportunity to touch on the many biblical themes that show up in not only Jojo, but many writings and productions across the world. An example from part one is the conflict between Jonathan and Dio, which has many parallels to the story of Jacob and Esau, two brothers who fight over their father's inheritance. Even things like The Legend of Zelda or Harry Potter deal with a young, naturally gifted protagonist who helps his community and eventually sacrifices his life after learning of his origins and greater purpose. And while Dyer may not be Jesus, he sacrifices himself for not only a cause, but those he cared about. It's not exactly the same, but believe me when I say there are plenty of biblical lessons and stories that show up in the most unexpected places, either by chance or by design. And don't even get me started on Steel Ball Run. I want to do a huge video on it, but it's probably best to wait until the anime comes out and brings like 50% more fans with it. Diary's Jesus gets an F tier. It doesn't make any sense at all. <laughs> Next. Keicho knew Okiyasu could kill their father. Keicho Nijimura is a stand user from the beginning of part 4 with a mission to kill his father who has been struck with a horrifying and painful deformity. Okiyasu frequently helps his brother create and locate other stand users, and this theory states that, well, Okiyasu could have just been the one to put Mr. Nijimura to rest. This is another entry that's less of a theory and more of an implied answer to an obvious plot hole. Let me paint a conversation with you. Didn't Keicho know that Okiyasu could have just removed their dad from existence instead of creating a bunch of evil stand users? Why yes, Keicho definitely knew of his brother's stand potential, but first of all, Okiyasu is younger, less mature, and overall less equipped to deal with killing his own father, even in the name of mercy. The hand could end up cutting off part of their father or accidentally sending him to the other side of the galaxy. Not to mention, it completely undermines the idea that this man is wielding far more power than he realizes, not only commanding a literal small army in the form of bad company, but abusing the power of the stand arrow in pursuit of a personal goal he could have achieved on his own. Although the story has a happy ending thanks to Josuke, Keicho really should have been the one to do the deed. As the older, smarter brother with a more tactical stand ability, it was extremely irresponsible to go around creating stand users when he could have just gotten a gun and a therapist and done it himself. Keicho knew Okiyasu could kill their father, and for that reason this theory gets a D tier. Next, Jorno is transgender. It's a widely known fact that Araki was considering a female protagonist for part 5 until his editor brought up how it may be poorly received by Jojo's mostly young male audience. 
Araki would end up using some of his leftover ideas for Jolene in Part 6, but we can still see remnants of what this character could have been. The Jojo Veller art book gives some more clarification on this, confirming that Gold Experience's ability to create life and Giorno's original and more feminine name, Haruno, are reflections of this earlier build. This is a cool bit of history, and it's interesting to think about what ideas may have been included or scrapped if Jolene was around a decade earlier. C tier, next. <laughs> the world copied the stands of all living Joe stars. Stardust Crusaders kicks off with the Joe Star family mysteriously developing stand abilities. Joseph Joe Star, now an older man, gains Hermit Purple. Jotaro develops Star Platinum. Josuke gets extremely sick. And Holly, Jotaro's mother, develops a vine like stand ability that begins to slowly kill her, thus kicking off the main conflict for Part 3. This theory states that based on the power Dio has in Part 3, the world copied the abilities of all living Joe Stars. This is a cool idea, but it's been largely accepted as false due to various holes in the theory and statements from Araki himself clarifying. While the design certainly looks similar to Crazy Diamond, the eventual stand of Josuke in Part 4, this was probably a coincidence, and we see no healing powers apart from Dio's normal vampire abilities. He does become more clairvoyant after unlocking Joseph Joestar's version of Hermit Purple, but it's largely disconnected from his other stand. Jotaro doesn't even have the world until the end of Part 3, meaning that if Dio had copied the world in Hermit Purple from Jotaro and Joseph, he probably would have copied the undiscovered stands of Holly and Josuke. This iceberg actually considers Giorno 2, claiming that the world merely copied Gold Experience's color, but I think the series has a good enough explanation for Dio's abilities, and something this concrete would have been explained. Overall, an interesting idea that certainly fits with Dio's character, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe Araki left this idea on the cutting room floor during the production of Part 3. C tier. While we're on the subject of stands, let's look at the next entry covering another powerful villain from the beginning of the series. Kars stand would have been a buffed Hermit Purple. As mentioned previously, Kars is the leader of the Pillar Men who successfully unlocked the power of the Stone Mask. This actually results in Kars learning Hamon and becoming proficient. Some believe that all Hamon users get Hermit Purple, but to my knowledge there are only two cases to base this off, being Jonathan and Joseph Joestar. If Kars learned Hamon from the Joestars, would his stand be a stronger version of Hermit Purple? What if he had just learned Hamon naturally when he became the Ultimate Life Force? I think Hamon would have taken on a different form in somebody as powerful as Kars, but even if it turned out to be Hermit Purple, it probably wouldn't be overwhelmingly strong, at least compared to Joseph and Dio's use of it. There are many instances of stands training and evolving in the series, but an ability generally stops increasing in power after a certain point. This is actually a big part of Diamond is Unbreakable and beyond, because after a certain point, training cannot increase or add to the power of a stand. Looking at the difference between Joseph and Dio's use of Hermit Purple, we can see an example of how stand abilities don't scale a ton with the user's power. And Dio and Jotaro actually train their time stop abilities, but it is shown and implied to be very difficult. This theory gets a C tier. Not a lot gets said about Kars, considering he was the last threat to be fought in a world without stands, but it's hard to play what ifs when the point of ending battle tendency was to move on and introduce new material. To finish off the Pillar Men, let's cover a fun theory about one of the many things that make this series so awesome, the music references. Cars, Wamu, and ACDC represent Earth, Wind, and Fire. This entry speculates that the abilities used by the Pillar Men in Part 2 are representative of Earth, Wind, and Fire, referencing the band of the same name. This is actually the name given to Miki Taka's ability, and while it may be a nod to the theory that he's a reformed version of Cars, I gotta be honest, I think it's stretching a little bit. Yes, Wamu and ACDC use the power of wind and fire, but Cars manipulates light and organic life forms. Very basic elements of nature, but not representative of Earth or the planet itself. Maybe this was a starting point when coming up with ideas, but even Santana doesn't represent Earth in the same obvious way the others represent wind and fire. This theory gets a D tier. I think it's a little out there and not super likely, but correct me in the comments if I'm wrong. Next, Thoth predicted Jotaro's death. Ah, the debates over the power of Thoth in Part 3 are as old as the manga itself. The concept of fate is a recurring theme in Jojo, and in Part 3 we're introduced to Zenyatta and Mandata, also known as the Oingo Boingo brothers. Today we're focusing on Mandata, the younger brother, who has the ability to create manga that tells the future. When predicting the death of Jotaro, the comic shows his face splitting in half, and although Jotaro lives through this event, the prophecy is seemingly fulfilled in two instances of Jotaro's death later in the series. Starting from the beginning, Zenyatta and Mandata plot various ways to kill the Crusaders in Part 3, leading to this infamous image of Jotaro's death. 
Despite working with the knowledge he gained from Thoth, Zenyatta blows himself up after using his ability to look like Jotaro. The punchline is, haha, the comic never said the person actually had to be Jotaro, confirming that Zenyatta took Jotaro's place and reiterating that the comic never lies. This was the assumption until the end of part 4 where we see Jotaro's face split in half when Killer Queen uses Bites the Dust. This, of course, is undone but still raises questions about Jotaro's fate. But when Jotaro is killed by Pucci in part 6, his face splits in half in the exact same way, again. There's a lot backing up the theory that not only Mandata's manga was correct about Jotaro's future, but that Jotaro was always fated to die this way. As a bonus, it lines up with the way Rolling Stone works, where people have a degree of free will but are fated to experience certain events. This is an A-tier entry, not only because it has a lot of intrigue and credibility, but because it ties together the central themes and characters of the series in a really unique way. Next up, the two schoolgirls arguing over Jotaro were friends. Yes, it looks like they were friends. In the beginning of part 3, we see a group of schoolgirls approach Jotaro and attempt to get his attention. Two of them begin calling each other names, but eventually go on with their day after Kakyoin comes into the story. These girls seem to just be friends or classmates, nothing more or less. If there was any drama, it would have been explored more, and they seem to have a sort of hierarchy, so yeah, friends. This gets an F tier, for friends. It would have been a D if I didn't have to explain it in such detail. Next, Jotaro suffers from hearing loss. In Chapter 1 of Part 3, Jotaro points a gun at his own head to demonstrate the power of Star Platinum. He stops the bullet by grabbing it, but some have theorized that he sustained permanent hearing loss. Just kidding, nobody thinks that. Interestingly, there is a splatter of red between the revolver and Jotaro's ear, but this is probably just to fake the reader out, since it's never addressed again. Jojo does this a lot, that is, depicting someone getting shot or stabbed, then when the rug is pulled and we find out the character didn't die, we're just supposed to act like there was no blood in the first place? This one gets a D tier. Slightly more interesting. Next, Caesar is a sex criminal. Caesar is the lead supporting character in part 2 and serves as Joseph Joestar's rival and later best friend. Caesar's mother died a long time ago and his father abandoned the family to train with Haman and protect the world from the Pillar Men. Due to his upbringing, Caesar had become a criminal, stealing and destroying the property of others. This entry refers to the line stating Caesar had committed every crime short of murder, but the original line reads as theft, burglaries, fights, and arsons. The only crime he hadn't committed was murder. Caesar also isn't depicted as super pervy, at least compared to Joseph, so I don't know if he would have been that much of a degenerate as an edgy teenager. Also using this logic, we could say that Caesar committed tax fraud, he turned left on red, and that he sold user data to a foreign country. My point is, the list of Caesar's crimes probably stayed within the realm of Hamburglar, and not into the realm of Grimace Mama, and Ronald. Caesar is probably not a sex criminal, D tier. And thus concludes Layer 2 of the JoJo Theories Iceberg. The complete version of this iceberg will be continuing on, but until then, you get your standard YouTuber outro. Seriously, thanks guys for listening this far. Uh, leave any comments, corrections, any criticisms, anything else. Um, check out the podcast if you want something to just turn on and listen to like this. Or if you want something completely different, check out my other channels. I do Pokemon cards, I do food reviews. It's a really fun time. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you all in the next video. Peace. Tastes like toxic waste, like warheads. Yes, yes, yes. Oh my god.